It is Friday morning in Switzerland, it's Friday afternoon in Hong Kong, and it's Space Cafe Greater Bay, Air Bay Area time. Our first, our brand new Space Cafe GBA by Blaine Kosiu will begin soon. Uh, he will explain the naming of our regional program then in a minute. As always, we appreciate your participation and your ongoing feedback. We will learn and we will improve based on your feedback. I'm Thorsten Kreening, the publisher of Spacewatch.global, and we are a Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. With um, the very well-known uh, Blaine Kosio of Orbital Gateway Consulting, we found a great friend, an awesome contributor to our magazine, and a wonderful host for our regional outreach. I know many of you are a are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters, and the Space Cafe podcast. We also keep our fan shop open online for you to support us actively to become a space watcher. Edition 1 has cool items for you, your friends, and the ones you love. And your support is needed to keep our work alive. And we do that for you. If you missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive on our website in the event section and on YouTube. We will host our Space Cafe Greater Bay Area live regularly. And with that, my job is done and I like to hand over to your host in Hong Kong today, Blaine, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Thorsten, and welcome everyone to the first Space Cafe Greater Bay Area reporting live from Hong Kong. Uh, just a very small piece of local news before getting into our interview today. Um, so yes, uh, on Wednesday this week, we did see the Tianhe core module of the Chinese space station launch on a Long March 5B from Wenchang. So a very big accomplishment for the Chinese space program and a big uh, big congratulations to, to the team. That's a, a very cool mission. Um, so now turning over to the, the interview with the esteemed Greg Defner. Uh, so just a very brief biography of Greg. So Greg Defner is the founder and CEO of GAPSAT, which leases in-orbit operational satellites to satellite operators for use in their orbital slots for interim periods of time, generally until the operator launches its own satellite. Previously, Greg co-founded and was president of Asia Broadcast Satellite, otherwise known as ABS. He headed satellite services for Hong Kong Telecom, was VP for Pan Am Sat and Lockheed Martin, and Director of International Policy for the U.S. Government's National Telecommunication and Information Administration. Greg is a founding member and the president of the Asia-Pacific Satellite Communications Council, otherwise known as APSCC, and is the chairman of AVIA, formerly known as CASBOB, and also the Satellite Wireless Action Group. Greg is an attorney who began his career in New York as a New York-based filmmaker and video artist. Uh, so, Greg, welcome to the first episode of the Space Cafe Greater Bay Area. Thank you. Great to be here. Great. Well, um, I guess, uh, did you want to um, start off with a, an introduction of your, um, your career path and, and sort of from what angle have you come into the satellite communications industry? What is your background and uh, where did you come from to get here? The, um, I'd be happy to tell the story. Um, it's a cautionary tale. But before we get started, actually, Blaine, the title uh, for this, what will be a series of, uh, of webinars is, a description is Greater Bay Area. For those people that are not actually living here in what is now referred to as the GBA, can you explain to the audience what this is and why it's relevant? That's a good point and a good good starting point. Yeah, so the GBA is uh, is an agglomeration of nine cities in uh, in Guangdong in mainland China, and then also Hong Kong and uh, and Macau. So it basically it would be about a hundred million people, including uh, mega cities like Guangzhou and, and Shenzhen. And basically, these nine mainland Chinese cities plus Hong Kong and Macau are becoming uh, increasingly interconnected. And one of the more interesting examples that Greg, I'm sure you you'd have seen here is the. Uh, the bridge that now goes from Hong Kong all the way over to uh, to Macau and Zhuhai, which is also a tunnel, and I believe is the world's longest, or maybe one of the world's longest bridges. So yeah, GBA is uh, is this part of the world? Yes, Greater Bay yes. Area, frequently referred to as the bridge to nowhere. 
Um, thank you. Thank you, Blaine, and welcome. Uh, to give you a little bit of background as to who I am and how I got here and why you should be listening. Um, I guess we'll start, I was born in New York City. I'm an American, uh, although I've been living here in Hong Kong now for a little less than 15 years this time. Um, I'll skip over most of my formative years and say that I, I went to college in, uh, in Grinnell, Iowa, a small liberal arts school called Grinnell College. Um, and while I was a junior, halfway through my junior year, I was in New York City for vacation, uh, Christmas vacation, and I was at a party and I'm, I'm, I met somebody who was fantastic, Susie Klein, fell in love and ended up dropping out of, uh, of college. So when we get to the story of like, uh, how can you make a career in the space and satellite industries? Um, part of my story is a kind of roundabout how I got here. Um, suggesting that anyone can do it, regardless of where you come from or what trail you take. Uh, after about six months, I went back to college. I, I went to New York University uh, School of the Arts, Institute of Film and Television, and became a filmmaker. And I stayed in New York for about five years, principally earning my, my living making television commercials. I worked for a couple of production companies, um, and in anticipation of the obvious question, have you seen any of my work? You have, lots of it, but um, uh, only if you're old enough to have been watching TV in those days. I would tell you that probably the most famous commercial I ever did was for Coca-Cola, and it starred um, a well-known football player at the time named Mean Joe Green and played at the uh, Super Bowl, actually, for the first time. Um, after I, I did this this film and I did a bunch of television, um, I decided that I wanted to sort of expand my, my horizons. And I had this idea of, of, um, of, for many years, of becoming a lawyer. So I went to law school, went to Boston University School of Law in Boston. Um, and I focused, uh, to the degree that anyone focuses in law school on any particular area, I focused on communications and with a kind of subspecialty in international law. Um, when I got out of school, I moved to DC, uh, Washington DC, because that's where regulatory law and international regulatory law is practiced largely in the United States. Um, I was in private practice with a couple of law firms in DC. And then I got hired to work for, as, as Blaine mentioned, the uh, National Telecommunications and Information Administration, just rolls off the tongue. NTIA is the executive branch counterpart to a much better known entity, which is the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. So NTIA works for the president of the United States and does information and communications policy. Um, I did that for five years and one day. Uh, towards the end of my career, I, because of some of the positions we'll talk about, I hope, uh, in this conversation, um, as a free thinker and a pro-competition, um, pro-privatization advocate within the government, um, I became the subject or the object of a uh, concerted attack, if you will, by some of the monopoly players that... Um, that didn't like the idea of, of liberalization in, in the regulatory marketplace. And so it became a lot less fun to be a policymaker with everyone looking over my shoulder. Fortunately, I also impressed on the other side, the founder of the first privately owned international satellite system, a guy named Rene Anselmo, who single-handedly uh, founded a satellite company and bought his own satellite with his own money. Uh, Pan Am Sat, Pan Am Sat One, um, and I worked there. Uh, I worked there. I worked in uh, their headquarters in uh, Greenwich, Connecticut, for some years until Rene died. Um, then the company was taken over and it went mainstream. That story went. It was purchased by Hughes and then ultimately purchased by Intelsat, the very entity that it had been formed to uh, to compete with. Um, irony of ironies. I went on, I became a consultant. I got hired by a cable and wireless Hong Kong Telecom, which brought me to, help, to, to Hong Kong for about a year and a half. Um, and my role was to teach a telephone company new tricks, to teach them 
how to be a competitor in a increasingly competitive ecosystem. Um, it didn't sit well and uh, telephone companies are notoriously bad at doing those kinds of things, but I did my best. Um, I, got a, I got an offer to go uh, to leave uh, Hong Kong to go and work in London, as it turns out, for a new entity that Lockheed Martin was creating, was a joint venture with a international intergovernmental satellite entity, which owned no satellites. It was, it's called Intersputnik, which was the Soviet counterpart in the old days, and it still remains um, now Russian, the Soviet counterpart to Intelsat. Um, mm -hmm. And the company was Lockheed Martin Intersputnik LMI. Um, I worked there until Lockheed, uh, well, actually until the, uh, after the, um, the bombing of the World Trade Center um, and the 9-11. And uh, basically what happened was the war on terror replaced the kind of peace dividend that we had had after the Berlin Wall fell. Um, and Lockheed Martin decided to pursue its first love, which was government contract kind of work. I left the company, became a consultant, and then had this inspiration uh, a couple of years later to, since Lockheed had lost interest in, in these commercial ventures, um, of going back and seeing if I couldn't buy LMI from Lockheed. And I, I got together a small group of investors and we did buy LMI and we rebranded it and revitalized it as Asia Broadcast Satellite, ABS, um, until I stayed there until the company was sold by its original investors. And then I went off and I started the company, which I'm now the CEO of, which is Gapsat. So that's really how I'm here. Well, it's a fascinating and, and a very, it's a very varied background, a lot of different things and a lot of different places. And, and I don't know if you just saw, but uh, you put a smile on Torsten's face by uh, mentioning Intersputnik because apparently the wonderful Aline Morozova of Intersputnik runs the Space Cafe Russia. So that was a uh, nice little shout out to, uh, to them. So, so one of the, the points that you mentioned uh, kind of early on in your, in your career summary was your, you know, being a fan of, of kind of private enterprise and deregulation and, and kind of um, free market competition, this kind of thing. And, and in an earlier conversation that you and I had uh, earlier this week, you were talking about, you know, the early days of, of SATCOM as this kind of tool of liberation, where we were living in this world of monopolistic telcos, and, and then SATCOM came in as this, uh, to a certain extent, well, uh, initially also monopolistic, but then a liberal liberalizer. Uh, so wondering if you could just give a kind of a, your, your take on, on that period of time, which I feel is, is fascinating and not well appreciated and becoming increasingly relevant today. So it would be great to, uh, to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. So if, if you think about satellite communications, um, the reality is that it knows no real borders. I mean, no matter how much they try to focus beams, the fact is they spill over from, from one geographic area into another. Um, and the beauty of satellites as a infrastructure, when compared to terrestrial infrastructure, principally wireline, but even, even wireless uh, mobile communications, is that the, uh, the towers are far away and outside of the control of any government. And therefore they are sort of inherently um, uh, vehicles for what I refer to as pirate radio. Um, they may act responsibly, they may follow the laws of countries, but the reality is that they're sort of beyond the control of, of governments. Um, and one of the things that we've seen here in Asia, maybe we'll come back to it later, is the um, fact that in some countries that have historically um, placed limitations on access to and, and accessing specific foreign satellites is that it's very hard to police that. It's very hard to know what satellite are you pointing to? Um, you know, are you communicating to a domestic satellite, to a foreign satellite, to, an, to a global satellite system? Um, so, and the fact is that anyone in theory um, uh, can have their own satellite or can control a satellite or a satellite system. Um, and it decouples from the traditional telcos, which are very much national enterprises with 
that are heavily regulated and, and licensed, and there are you know very often uh, rules concerning um, the nationality of the owners and the control. Um, satellites um, operate differently, uh, mm -hmm. but back when when satellite communication was just starting. Um, and for those of you that don't know this, this is like a, I think, kind of a, a cool phenomenon. Um, in the 1940s, there was a science fiction writer who later became very famous, Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote a, um, a nonfiction piece theorizing that if you place an object into space at a distance from the Earth equal to the circumference of the Earth at the equator, um, that that object that you place in space would remain in space in the same position relative to the Earth as the Earth moved, it would move at the same speed and would always seem to be stationary. Hence the creation of two things, one geostationary satellite, the concept, and two, what later became described as the Clark belt of satellites that go 360 degrees around the Earth at the equator. Um, turned out years later, uh, when NASA or its, its predecessor was thinking about doing some experiments um, along these lines, they remembered this, this piece that they read uh, by Arthur C. Clarke, and they, they, they did the math and they said, it looks like it probably works. And it turns out um, the only thing that Arthur C. Clarke did not do, um, thankfully, was he didn't patent his idea. So therefore he didn't get rich off of it, but we're all the beneficiaries of his wisdom. Um, in 1962, or thereabouts, um, there was a discussion about uh, creating a, a global satellite system. And uh, this was when uh, Kennedy was president. Um, and so the Kennedy administrations championed what became Intelsat, um, which was a treaty-based organization of governments that got together um, and later expanded by adding more governments and more players to initially there was one satellite, then there were two, then three and three ocean regions creating global coverage and then so on and so forth. But um, when it was created, a couple of interesting aspects of it. First of all, the early 60s was also the time where European uh, colonial powers were um, discovering that their colonies were growing restless and demanding independence. Um, and one of the curious things about the colonies, European colonies, was that the way their, their, um, their uh, telephone traffic was, uh, was set up, the actual infrastructure, the, the physical uh, cables, um, the cable switching was set up in European capitals. So colonies of, uh, of England, which switched through London, colonies of France, which switched through Paris. And so when, the, when this um, opportunity arose to create a global satellite system, one of the things that, that Kennedy uh, and his administration wanted to do was take the lead in, in, in championing the independence of these countries and their, their actual communications independence from their colonial masters by trying to decouple the infrastructure from the old colonial relationships so that you didn't have to go through the, the old capitals, um, which actually works, I think scored a lot of points for the US um, in the hearts and minds of, of these, these newly forming countries. The other thing was that the administration was very concerned that the dominant monopoly um, US international telephone company, AT&T in those days, um, should not expand its monopoly into this new technology, global satellite communications. And so they, they actually created the, the Satellite Act, 62 Satellite Act, which prohibited uh, AT&T from owning more than a small percentage. And in order to then create uh, what was then a vacuum, create an entity that would assume that role for the United States, um, they created the a company called ComSat, which became the signatory um, and U.S. In, um, owner of in the interests of the United States in the Intelsat system. Um, many years later, just as an aside, and actually just before I left Lockheed Martin, but after Lockheed had lost their interest in, in the LMI project, um, Lockheed decided that it wanted to buy 
ComSat, which was probably a great idea, but the way the actual legislation had been written, the statute prohibited any entity, not just AT&T, because they couldn't single out AT&T. So Lockheed suddenly found itself in a position where it couldn't take over control of this, uh, of this ComSat entity. And so they had, they waged a couple of year fight to get the law changed so that they could step into, to, they could be liberated and they could, uh, they could step into the shoes of taking control. Um, and interestingly, though it's not true anymore, and so, you know, we, we kind of don't, don't remember this, um, for like the first 20 plus years, uh, Intelsat carried something like 90% of the global tele international telephone traffic. Um, today, very little traffic is, is conducted over any satellites. Um, but in those days, it was before the advent of, of fiber optic cables, and it gave a lot more flexibility. Um, then, interestingly, in the 1980s, so skipping ahead 25 years, 24 years, the, um, there were the first rumblings for uh, free enterprise in space, basically, was the movement. Um, and so two things happened. One was uh, President Reagan was in the White House and there were some interesting things that happened um, with the, uh, the NASA space shuttle program. But essentially, there were a number of, of private entities that really wanted to begin to provide launch services. And it, they found it impossible to compete with NASA, which was providing commercial launch services for, for communication satellite companies and others um, using the shuttle and charging only a small percentage of the actual costs to NASA for doing those launches. Um, but it's a government entity, so they didn't really pay attention to their bottom line. Um, so in, in October of, 90, of 84, um, and in order to encourage private enterprise in space, um, there was a policy that was created that prevented NASA from launching commercial satellites um, in order to support the, the creation of private, ex what were then expendable launch vehicles, ELVs. Um, Today, we of course have gone kind of full circle to uh, recyclable launch vehicles, um, but the notion is still the same one. And interestingly, the, the way it was described um, was that it was to encourage entrepreneurial ventures in information technology, remote sensing and telecommunications. A month later in, in November of 1984, the so-called separate system policy was promulgated. Again, another Reagan policy that determined that separate international communication satellite systems were required in the US national interest. Um, the problem was that under the Intelsat Treaty, there was an obligation that all member nations had to Intelsat to support, to protect, to provide, to, to, you know, to encourage and use the Intelsat system and there was an actual specific provision, which was basically the, a um, provision that prevented a country from, from licensing or actually engaging in activity, which would cause what was described as significant economic harm to Intelsat. So anyway, long story short, the first uh, uh, private entities in the US that applied for licenses from the FCC, um, those, those applications were submitted before the new policy, but as soon as the policy came into being, the FCC was directed by the president to, to um, and encouraged to grant those licenses. And one of the first licenses granted was to Pan AMSAT. Um, and interestingly, when the question of conducting private satellite competition with Intelsat came up, and it came up in the context of these consultation meetings with Intelsat that were conducted by Intelsat and Intelsat's members who had a vested interest in Intelsat were the ones to determine what, if anything, caused significant economic harm. So it was sort of like one of the uh, litigants was also judge and jury. Um, the conclusion was and yeah, this is, it's great. The conclusion was 
no one knew at what point significant economic harm would occur. Um, but the, in order to clearly avoid it, the decision was made that a satellite, um, a satellite company which provided fewer than 164 kilobit telephone calls at any one time. So 64 kilobit just happens to be what the, the normal bandwidth for telephone circuits before they created compression and all the rest. So basically 100 telephone calls could go over mm. a private satellite system at any one time, which is ludicrous. At the time, I don't, I don't remember precisely, but I think Intelsat had in excess of 20,000 simultaneous circuits um, of telephone conversations going at one time. So 100 obviously was far from going to be where the right red line was going to be. Um, mm. uh, so when Pan Am set was created, one of the interesting things was they didn't go after telephone service at all. They went after broadcast services. And the beauty of broadcaster services, broadcasters in those days, this is in the world of analog. This is before the digital revolution. But in those days, a broadcast television free to air kind of you know, signal would take up anywhere from, from a half to a full transponder, 18 megahertz to 36 megahertz for a single channel. Um, so, you know, it's good business. And if, if you could find a bunch of broadcasters, you could fill up your whole satellite in a lot faster time than if you had to fill them up with, with 64 kilobit channels to stack them up to, to fill a satellite. Um, so, well, just to, uh, to dig a little bit more into one of the points that you mentioned here. So this, this site, well, so if I think about the, the table stakes, let's say in the 1950s compared to say the 1980s compared to say the 2000s compared to now, if I want to send a message from Johannesburg to London, yeah. So what in the fifties you have, it, you need to be a massive telco with lots of, of fiber everywhere. I mean, there, there's or let's say the Ford, you know, and, and I guess under, you know, after you had a kind of global system with Intelsat that was kind of a monopoly, but still it was this global, the table stakes were lowered to whatever, a, a $300 million geo satellite. And there's, you know, one company doing it. And then I guess by the, you know, by the 2000s, there were many companies that were buying different types of satellites and that were lower price and that were, you know, more flexible. And, and I think now what we're seeing is this, even this further evolution and this further lowering of the table stakes to where if you want to procure a satellite or if you, well, if you want to launch a system like that, I mean, it, it's, it, the costs are coming down considerably. There's a lot of new technology. There's things like condo sats or, or small geos, these, these kind of different things. Um, so from your perspective, are, are, are we seeing this sort of second wave of democratization of the industry where it's becoming easier for a larger variety of, of people to, to be getting into the SATCOM business? Or do you have any, any, any thoughts on these, these developments? Right. Okay, so the SATCOM business consists of the, the companies that operate the stuff in, in outer space. And then the other part of it is everyone else on the ground in between, whether it's physical uh, facilities, earth stations, ground systems, um, or value added services, applications and so forth. Um, on the ground, clearly there's been a huge amount of, uh, of, uh, of advancement. Um, the, the way the Intelsat system was developed, they used to require the use of 30 meter multi-million dollar antennas, which only made sense if you had enormous amounts of traffic going through it. No one would ever build a 30, middle, 30 meter antenna if you would just had a thin route kind of services or you just were doing a few TV channels or whatever. Um, today, and, and what Pan Amsat did starting then with launching much more powerful satellites than the Intelsat system had. So it made them much more attractive from a from a from a performance and economic perspective, but continuing throughout um, history from the 80s until today, the satellites have become much more powerful, much more capable, much more flexible, um, and as a consequence, the people that are using them on the ground, um, there's this dem democratization process that you alluded to earlier. Um, access is is real, real, tel rel relatively inexpensive, um, and and very widespread um, with the lowering of the orbits 
to Mio and now to Leo for communications. Um, the size of the earth um, equipment that's needed in order to, to make the link between the, the ground system and the satellite becomes smaller, requires less power, and it, it, it further enhances the availability at low cost to a much wider um, uh, group of people. So it's been an inexorable process of, of opening this up and making it easier, cheaper, faster, better, et cetera. Um, and from the, from the perspective of the satellite operators, um, the, the same is true. Um, two things have happened, uh, or several things have happened. One is the, um, the traditional satellites have become lower cost. Um, they have, they now live a lot longer. In the days I was describing, satellites um, lifetime in orbit, uh, station kept orbit was five to seven years. And then that went up to 10 years. And now it's standard is 15 years, but in fact, um, the satellites are built with electronics that can last at least 20 years. And depending on the amount of fuel that actually is on board and how it's used, uh, there are satellites, traditional FF, uh, fixed satellite services, FSS satellites that can operate for 30 or more years um, in geostationary. So that means that the, you know, the cost for any parts of that are much lower. Now we have two things um, that are very exciting. One is we have a, a significant lowering the cost of access to space, i.e. rockets. The launch service industry is, is exploding with lots of new players, hundreds of new players, um, not that many actually providing the launch services yet, but with, with big not ideas. Yet, maybe, you know, it's there. They're getting there, yeah. They're, They're getting, getting there. there. Yeah. I was, yeah. Um, and the and the, the so the costs have come down substantially with competition mm -hmm. and with new technology and clever you know clever people like Elon Musk coming up with reusable rockets and and so forth. But the on the other side is that the smallification of of uh, the infrastructure. So satellites for years got bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and as a consequence, there was a push for the rockets to get bigger, to have larger fairings so that the physical size, that the, the physical weight that they could lift to, uh, to geostationary um, could increase. Um, and at the same time, there was a whole nother movement, which was to less is more, um, to have smaller satellites that could, could operate for shorter periods of time, because let's face it, with, with rapidly changing technology, to put up a satellite that's gonna last 15 plus years, and that's not, that's 15 plus years from launch, but you start planning it three or four or five or more <clears throat> years before you get to the launch. So it's 20 years plus. You're, you're, the whole plan and the design and, and then the build and the actual satellite is state of the art circa, you know, years ago. And it's not really yeah. today. So having a satellite that that costs a lot less, but lasts a shorter period of time, uh, if you can do it in a responsible fashion and not just create more space junk, um, is a terrific opportunity. And again, the democratization process, um, it allows much greater access for a wider range of people and companies because it's now, it's moved from you used the hundred million dollars, but the traditional satellites were closer to 200 or 250 million dollars. Um, and they took, you know, two and a half years to build and then you had to wait till the launch was ready. Um, whereas now we're looking at satellites that are a fraction of that in size um, and in cost and have in many cases, even more capability than those big old, you know, heavy, heavy satellites. So it's, it's like it's like a miracle for those of you that aren't I mean, engineers. Yeah. It's fantastic. And, and to your point, I mean, it's really it's interesting the, these very two different and both, I guess, quite advantageous technologies of the the much bigger throughput on the very very big satellites where you can have a, a condo sat like our, our friends over at, uh, at GeoShare, for example, where they they build a very very big satellite and they sell pieces of it. Or you have the and or, or you have this you know this um, saying well the satellite used to weigh five thousand kilograms and now it's you know five hundred gigabits per second or however let's try to make it 
a few hundred kilograms and a few tens of gigabits per second, and then the whole thing is that much cheaper. So the, these two kind of uh, different ways of getting to the same endpoint, which is to give geostationary operators a lot more flexibility in uh, in procuring, you know, cost-effective capacity, capacity that is, uh, and, and I guess also to your point about the the rapid changes in the industry and the, the rapid kind of uh, changes in the price, uh, I, I guess it's helpful to, to have more flexibility as well there. So yeah, that's that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting dichotomy. Yeah. Um, so just a quick uh, quick reminder to the attendees that you're welcome to uh, to send any questions across in, in the Q and A. And um, Greg, I, I guess one one topic that we discussed a little bit yesterday before this. Uh, this record or well, before this broadcast was uh, was COVID and how COVID has impacted the industry and there's, there's a lot of different ways to approach that and uh, yeah I would I would welcome any any thoughts you have on uh, on how what kind of impact you've seen from COVID uh, whether it's on actual business or whether it's on uh, you know people being inspired by space and saying wow I I want to want to come and work here yeah okay well uh, good question um, and it's it's obviously very timely. I've talked to a lot of operators here in Asia, specifically, although um, around the world, and I, uh, most of them have really said the same thing, which is that COVID has not had a profound effect on their operations, their bottom line, their revenues, um, and certainly nothing like what they had anticipated, you know, a year plus ago when, when this whole thing began to melt down. Um, so that's, I think, very good. I think that the reality is that the biggest thing that's come out of COVID, of a, I mean, obviously COVID is a horrible thing, and I'm not saying that, that um, anyone should wish for something like this, but there is a, a, some silver linings. One of them is the recognition across the world um, just how critical universal broadband access is. Um, both for countries, enterprises, and consumers, um, as well as a recognition that, that universal service and the USO, the universal service obligation, is which used to pertain to fixed line and then it kind of expanded to, to, to mobile services and now, of course, includes broadband, the other thing that's, that came clear to many countries and policymakers is that um, the critical role that satellites play in delivering broadband and the fact that satellites are capable of providing what can be referred to as instant infrastructure. Once you have a satellite in space, the time to connect that satellite to, um, to uh, to entities that are using it is, you know, a matter of just being able to bring an earth station and set it up, plug it in and get it going, which is a matter of a day or several days, depending on where it's being shipped from. So, you know, you, you can deliver this thing very quickly, whereas no matter what you're doing in the way of, um, of terrestrial infrastructure build out, you're either spending years and, and billions of dollars digging holes and laying fiber across, you know, large geographic areas, or if you're even just putting up a cellular tower, it's, it, it, that takes quite a while. But on top of putting up the tower, you got to connect it to the network in order for it to be able to operate um, as part of the network. And that means you got to connect it with either wires or microwave or satellite. And again, so satellite becomes a critical component of that. And what that means for us is that governments that need to deliver broadband services that recognize the need that it's part of kind of uh, a, a basic human right, like access to clean water and to food, housing and so forth. Um, and it's, you know, it, 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 we've reached that point, although there's still an interesting debate in the US as to what constitutes um, uh, infrastructure development. Um, the bottom line is that their governments around the world are, are are prepared to throw lots of money at developing broadband uh, services and at underwriting the uh, the costs of putting up and, and delivering services via satellite. So that's great for our industry because let's face it, you know, if you were trying to deliver services to remote rural communities, 
there may be tremendous demand and great deal of need, but there may not be the economics necessary to be able to drive the, in a profit making um, enterprise to be able to successfully drive that as quickly as it should be. Unless there's someone with deep pockets, the government that comes along and says, this is a critical issue that we, that we want to, uh, to, um, to support. And we've seen this, you know, big countries and small countries around the world. Um, so we are all the beneficiaries of that. Um, and you alluded to one other thing, which was I, I had read an article in the uh, New York Times uh, on Wednesday, which had a front page article, which said, um, which said, nice. That's a wonderful prop to have for the uh, for the space. Yeah, company. it really is. You're wondering yeah, why I had this newspaper. It makes it feel like real life, you know? It's like, well, all right, so what is the, the headline from the New York Times? Priority after lockdown. It's not the office. And essentially, you know, the article explained that exhausted type A millennial workers in America, and, and that's a, an important uh, way of specifying it, um, to a much greater degree after having experienced this year-long process, have had a chance to take a look at their lives. And, 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 and now that they are being invited or required to go back to the office, they are in, in significant numbers stepping off the career mm. treadmill um, to, as the, the New York Times put it, to write that screenplay. One of the things, you know, I, I'm sure that, that there are some people like that that work in the space and the satellite industries, but I think that our sector inspires people, you know, space, the final frontier. It's something that people really love to do. They're, they're idealistic about it. They realize that we're gonna, we are and we will continue to increasingly change the world and worlds um, and that we are helping to, to make life better here on earth and beyond. So I, I think as a consequence, we probably won't see as much of a brain drain in our industry. Um, and I think that's great. Referring to worlds, plural, that is really thinking outside the box. And also, um, I guess to your point about, you know, this trend of, of people wanting to get out of the, the rat race to a certain extent, being a little bit more, um, you know, U.S. focused. I, I think that uh, here being the, the Space Cafe GBA and, and being in Hong Kong, I think it's probably correct to say that that trend does not really apply here. I don't see too many people in Hong Kong saying, you know what, I'm going to go and move to Lama Island and write my screenplay because I just can't be dealing with the rat race anymore. I think that's, uh, maybe there are some, maybe I haven't been to Lama in too long, but, but I think, um, yeah, no, but I think there's something to that for sure in, in the West, this idea that uh, as people start to kind of question their priorities and really wonder, you know, what, what the hell am I doing in this job? Um, I guess less people will think that if their job is, uh, you know, something as inspirational and, and kind of, interest uh well prone to attract people who are interested as, as space yeah no that that's that's a good point um i guess one of the other things that you mentioned here as a, as a result of COVID is this increased i guess awareness of the governments and of people in general of the importance of connectivity and as a result the, the importance of, of satellite sector let's say so over the last couple of years we've seen you know this broader awareness of, of the satellite sector by a lot of people. And one of the you know, are arguably more important groups of people that would be included there are our financiers. We've seen a lot of new money coming into commercial space companies and, and, uh, and just a lot of, well, a lot of venture capital investment. Um, do you have any, any thoughts on whether this is, you know, it's a good, whether it's a, a good thing or whether it's sustainable or, or, you know, what this means for the industry, having a lot more money coming in to do both very large audacious projects like Starlink, but even just, uh, you know, to have 20 commercial launch companies in China, for example, all of them trying to do a, a, you know, some variation of a fairly standard rocket, let's say. Um, so any, any thoughts on, uh, on the financial state of the sector at the moment in that regard? Yeah, well, uh, uh, thanks. I, I, think, um, I think that there are a lot of of innovative ideas that are competing for investments. And as a company, um, we didn't really talk about GAFSAT that's engaged now in the process of fundraising so that we can move from doing 
uh, what we traditionally have done for the last, pretty much the last decade, which is recycling other companies, other operators in orbit satellites and are now looking to procure our own custom built flexible satellites um, so that we control the process um, and not just um, get lucky sometimes when a, an operator no longer has a need to hold on to its, its existing satellite because it's been replaced typically. Um, we, we very much are aware of, of what's going on in the, cap, in the capital markets. And so the fact that there's more money, even if a lot of it is stupid money, uh, means that there's a greater opportunity for a much wider um, and broader segment of, of these, these new ideas, these innovative ideas to be exposed and potentially to actually raise raise funding. Um, at the same time, we're seeing a number of, of crackpot schemes, um, proposals from, from, from companies to uh, develop very expensive projects, and they're also attracting money. But the, the good thing about, about the way the free enterprise system works is investors are, are investing their money and there's no harm to the rest of, of us that think it's, it's silly or crackpot, and we may be wrong. So let a thousand flowers blossom is, is actually a, a good mantra uh, in this context. Um, I, think, I think that uh, two other things. One is that, and I mentioned government engagement in the process and encouraging and underwriting and actually you know, becoming anchor tenants saying, I will over X period of time, over the next seven years, we will, we will pay you know, upwards of $700 million in, in one case for satellite delivered broadband consumer services across our great nation. Um, the, I, I, I think one thing that we've discovered in, generally about good policy making is that it should be technology neutral. It shouldn't put its finger on the scale of what works, and what doesn't work. It, it allows the market to demonstrate. Obviously, they have to make judgments because they have to make they have to, they're going to be winners and losers that receive the money or don't receive the money. So there have to be inclusions, but they shouldn't come in saying we're only looking for for infrastructures that are this and not that. What they really should be looking for, in general, whether it's delivery of medicine, food, transportation, housing or communications is, is the function, the functionality. This is what we want to achieve. You tell us how you're going to achieve it. And what we've seen a number of, of, of countries, and the US is among them, um, but certainly not alone, that has become Leo obsessed. That rather than say, we recognize the value of satellite-based infrastructure, you know, show us what you got. They are only giving money in some cases to Leo constellations. And they're not giving a chance to, to like the, the uh, geo HDS systems to say, no, we can do the same for the delivery of broadband. We can, we can meet them jot for jot and we can do it in a more cost effective manner, faster, better, cheaper. Now, the jury is out as to what is the better, faster, cheaper, et cetera. But it's unfortunate when government um, engages that can blot out um, larger areas of, of the sunlight that allows these other companies to, um, and other technologies to grow. One other thing I'd mention, for years, a lot of us thought that the US was not a great place to set up businesses because of the fact that the process, which is a kind of publicly quasi-transparent process, allows for competitors to A, there's public notice of, of plans. So you go to the government and say, I want to do this, and they publish it. The FCC publishes the information. And everyone knows about your plans. A. B, they get a chance to criticize it and to say, you know, don't give them a license. And so that makes the process difficult because very often it's spurious kinds of arguments that really are anti-competitive and not anti, not scrutinizing the technology or, or the possibility of interference, et cetera. But I, what I've seen um, in the last several years is that, that by comparison with incorporating, for example, businesses in other countries, um, 
that the legal and regulatory processes are well established and, and they move relatively smoothly and relatively quickly. And, and because they're transparent, you know that it's, they're, they're not inherently corrupt, that things aren't happening you know, in an opaque fashion. A, B, the capital markets are much better developed and they have access to far more money from a larger pool of investors than in most countries in the world. Okay, now I don't live in America and I'm, I'm not waving the flag because I'm an American. I'm just simply observing that, that when we've looked at companies that look similar in terms of what they're doing and the amount of money that they have raised in say Australia, which has got a rule of set of, you know, rules of law and processes and so forth versus the US, just as an example, the amount of money that, that and the valuations that come out of companies that are doing in the US are significantly higher than comparables in, in many other countries. So from a business that looking you know, to set up, I have this argument with our, our, our CFO all the time because I like the fact that if we're offshore, we can, we can avoid taxes, for example. And he says, yeah, but you, know, you can't get the same kind of bank loans and so on and so forth. So anyway, another dimension. Well, we have a couple of questions from the audience, including one from our good friend, uh, Christopher Slaughter, who's, uh, who's in the house at the moment. So hello, Christopher, thank you for joining. Um, but I guess the, the, the we'll, we'll, we'll give our, our other attendee, Mark Meyer, the, the, the first question because he did ask it a couple of minutes earlier than, than did Christopher. Uh, and this one, maybe I will be answering more so than, than Greg, but anyway. Uh, could our Bay Area, so that is the greater Bay Area, uh, be a bridge between the East and West, a kind of uh, middle way to connect? So, Greg, do you want to take a take a stab at that, and then I can follow on? No, no, I think you're you're Mr. China, please. Sure. Well, I do think that the the Bay Area in I don't know necessarily that the greater Bay Area itself will be a bridge will be that much more of a bridge between East and West than this part of the world already has been. I mean, Hong Kong for a very long time has been kind of the bridge between at least China and the West. I mean, I don't, you know, and, and so you have a situation now where I think Hong Kong is likely to remain by a very, very wide margin, the most kind of international East-West bridge type city of all the cities in, in greater Bay Area. I, I don't think that's going to change. Um, I do think, however, if anything, GBA is going to probably make Hong Kong a little bit more looking towards mainland China, which might make Hong Kong a little bit less international, all else equal. But I do also think that cities like Shenzhen and Guangzhou, I mean, there's there's a fair amount of momentum there, I think, for large international companies to be setting up operations or, or otherwise just... I, I, I guess the short answer to your question is that I do think this area is going to become more international than it has been historically in, in general, largely driven by the mainland Chinese cities becoming a bit more international. Um, and I do think that Hong Kong is going to continue to have this um, very interesting you know, place between China and, and the West. It's going to change for sure in, in some ways, but I do think um, it, it will remain kind of distinct in some ways as well. So I don't know, Greg, any, anything to add from your side on the, on the GBA or, or Hong Kong? Uh, listen, I, I agree with everything you said. I'd only add that I, we've heard recently from um, the chief executive here and, and some of the, here in Hong Kong um, and some other politicians that they are hoping that Hong Kong will play an instrumental role in being a leader in this process in the greater Bay Area, um, that we will not be just, you know, kind of shunted aside and minimized. The, the hope I've heard recently is that there'll be more research and development kind of activities and prototype, you know, kind of business development concepts that'll, that'll come out of here. And then many of them will be implemented by the manufacturing powerhouses that we don't have here in Hong Kong, but, but does exist across the Bay in, in the mainland. Um, and I would assume that, that the cooperation would be an internal Bay Area cooperation initially, but that uh, there's my son walking across. Um, hey, Sam. Um, but then, um, you know, if real products and services are created, they will be looking not just to, to to um, distributing them in China, but presumably, and unless they're somehow very unique and, and not relevant to the rest of the world. 
So I, I think it'll be both. Hmm. Okay, and then we have our question from uh, from Christopher Slaughter. So it says, excellent history lesson. To what extent is the trend towards commercial exploitation of space also bringing change to the industry? Governments and militaries remain important clients, but how much more important is the private sector becoming? Do you want me to take a quick stab at that one and then you can you can take us home yes, here? Yes, please. Okay, so from my perspective, I do think that we're start, well, so I, I think to your, to the, Part of this question, uh, the, especially if we're looking at SATCOM, I think the vast majority of demand up until now has been at, in some way government, whether it's directly a USO or whether it's a some kind of other government requirement to have this ATM connected to the network, this kind of thing. So I think a lot of it has been government. Um, I think that what we're starting to see in terms of commercialization and becoming more relevant to the private sector is a broader variety of, of ways that even like consumers are becoming active in space and, and contributing to, to the development of the economy. So just as an example, uh, and it's a pretty niche example, but who knows, it could be, uh, it could be, uh, let's say, um, what's the word? It, it, it could be, man, what is the word? Uh, it could be duplicated, let's say. Um, in China, you have a, a YouTube-like video platform called Billy Billy. It's very popular among people under the age of like 30, let's say. And Billy Billy, they have a lot of very niche channels on this YouTube type platform that are, you know, nature channels or anime, all these things. And uh, last year, Billy Billy launched their own dedicated video Earth observation satellite, and they've made on this channel on their their online platform a kind of space channel where it's video taken from space of different parts of the Earth from this Billy Billy satellite. And I don't know if they're I don't know how the economics work there, whether they are making money on advertising from people watching lots of videos from the satellites or they're attracting new users because people who like space are now coming to Billy Billy. But overall, it seems like a very good way of, of doing kind of a B to C element of space um, via this kind of this platform, Billy Billy. So um, yeah, Greg, I don't know if you have any, any thoughts on, on Billy. Are you, a, are you a fan of Billy Billy or you've never, never come across that platform? I bet you like the name. It's a pretty, it's I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a user. And believe it or not, I don't fit the demographic of under 30. But let me ask my son, who is exactly half of that age. I know. Um, well, you know, I mean, but let, let's take a broader example, okay? Um, if we're developing, if someone is developing a, a broadband constellation, which is a, a bigger version of that thing, um, and they're competing with, so the, it's, let's say it's a LEO constellation with thousands of satellites and they're competing with other LEO constellations, maybe with one or more MEO constellations and with all the geo operators that are, that are going after you know, either the same or parallel uh, um, opportunities. The, it's gonna be fierce competition. It's gonna be a race to the bottom in pricing. And of course the, the best, the best hopefully will be also the lowest cost, but we don't know, they may cut corners, there may be other issues. Um, but let's, let's face it, there are other dimensions to how finance, th these activities might be underwritten. Of course, there's the government support that, that we talked about earlier, but if, imagine if you will, that someone who had a company like say Amazon and wanted to take Amazon Prime and, create a company that was going to deliver something that's not tangible products that, that are delivered by UPS or the post office or whoever, but instead are communication products. And they realized that they can increase their, their uh, consumer base dramatically if they were able to facilitate the development of additional broadband infrastructure. And that infrastructure might be you know, the one they chose would be their own um, Leo constellation, like Kuiper. And instead of just having to charge money to finance their system and go head to head with Starlink and with Telesat and with OneWeb, et cetera, they, they could layer on top of that a something which isn't even like the advertising model that Facebook and Google use. They could, they could layer on top of that we will give you free broadband or we'll bundle it with your, whatever your Amazon Prime subscription is, um, for example. Or if you don't have, you know, 
time member because you know you're, you're not doing something at that scale of, as a consumer and um, we could get into how good that consumerism is um it's still it becomes something that enables you to have a connection sorry amazon to have a connection for the occasional um shopper because now they've they've actually put together a platform and they they could get um you know um some kind of special access to their own customers because it's their system and they can and their own platform so they can they can leverage that to 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 sell what is their really profit um, profit focus center, which is the rest of the the Amazon world experience, um, and suddenly their charges, their economic view of 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 the ecosystem that they're operating in is completely different than the traditional communication service providers. Even if they're using new technologies, you know, and new infrastructures, um, they are coming at it not. To, in a in a one for one dollars and cents for this service because it's actually bundled and part of a greater set of of services which are not even communication services and you know I don't know how how does that fit in there but that is an alternative reality that I could see being real and I can see by the way um, companies like Facebook and Google getting in, into it for the purpose of of advertising dollars and eyeballs, sticky eyeballs and so forth, where they're not trying to necessarily sell real world goods, but it's social networking and, and other kinds of information services. So in answer, I, I think it, it can be both, it can be either, and it's gonna get very complicated and exciting. Indeed, well, Greg, we covered colonial independence, we covered mean Joe Green and Billy Billy and, uh, and, and a whole lot of other things, which is pretty good for, uh, for what, 55 minutes or so. Um, I think uh, I will turn it back over to Torsten now. This has been the, the first uh, Space Cafe GBA, and uh, thank you very much for listening. Torsten, go ahead. And Torsten, you might be on mute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No? It, it does help to unmute and to switch on the camera. So, <laughs> uh, still here. Wow, exciting. Uh, Greg, wonderful to have you. Um, I, I learned a lot, uh, I have to say. Uh, wonderful. So, um, we have our full agenda for uh, the next weeks uh, for, for you, our, our community and listeners. So, next week, in my 33 minutes, I will talk with... Uh, Timidayu Oni Sun from uh, Space in Africa about their global space budget report and uh, have a dig into that. Uh, a few days later, next week on Thursday, I will we will have the second edition of the Space Cafe Germany by uh, Andreas Schepers with our ESA astronaut uh, Thomas Reiter. Um, that will be an event in German language. Uh, a day later, we will kick off Canada, our uh, Space Cafe Canada by wonderful Dr. Jessica West, and she will have our Dr. David Kandel of the Outer Space Institute as her first guest. Um, a few days later, on the 11th, I will speak with Laura Forsyth in my 33 minutes. Uh, that's a short week due to the uh, holidays we have. So on the 18th, um, I will talk with Catherine Courtney from the UK about what's going on there. And in this week, we also launch our first Space Cafe UK with Laurie Scott and Robal. And their first guest will be Ian Jones of Goon Hilly Earth Station. So how cool can that be? Especially after our first Space Cafe Scotland yesterday. So now UK is back in the race as well. All events are on online on Eventbrite. As always, we would like to hear your feedback, so please check in with us on Twitter, on Facebook and LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up to our daily or bi-weekly newsletters of spacewatch.global and if you like to treat yourself with something special, become a Space Watcher today. Thank you very much for your interest today and thank you Blaine for this absolute outstanding first edition and Greg for being such a wonderful guest and this inspiring talk. And yeah, that's it from my end. I hope you all will stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks for joining us. Hope to see you next week. In the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. And don't forget, become a space watcher.